morning. My name is uh, Anna Ermakova. I'm a master's student in conservation science from Imperial College London. And today I'm going to talk about biota ecology and conservation in the United States, which was my project. I will start with a more general introduction about what is known about biota in the United States and then move on to my own research project. Uh, as you all know, biota is a, a psychoactive cactus. Uh, uh, growing in Mexico and the United States. It's uh, uh, bluish green in color, occasionally purple. It's usually when it's stressed. It has no spines, but it has those little white tufts that are modified spines. Uh, it grows solitary or in clusters. Uh, if it grows at clusters, often it's from the same root system, as you can see here on the picture of uh, some excavated piota. Uh, it reproduces sexually or asexually. If it reproduces asexually, it grows uh, little pumps or shoots at the side of the plant. And sexually, it produces uh, pink or pale pink flowers uh, that flower in spring and summer, March to September. And uh, then it produces fruits that are uh, pink or white. And if you haven't tried them, they're actually really tasty, and, but they don't have any masculine. Uh, the seeds are quite small, uh, they're black, brown in size, and that's how they look under um, microscope. Uh, Piyote has a very, very important uh, cultural, religious, and medicinal significance. Uh, the earliest archaeological re records date back 6,000 uh, years, and uh, in the USA it's uh, uh, sacrament to the members of Native American Church, and it's estimated that about uh, 250,000 members are using it, although it's very hard to estimate precisely how many people are using it and how frequently. And uh, beyond the central role in Native American Church has been recognized uh, formally only in 1994, even though the first Native American Church of Oklahoma has been uh, since 1918. The main uh, psychoactive component in peyote is mescaline, and it uh, was the first uh, psychedelic isolated. It was uh, the end of 19th century by Arthur Hefter. Peyote also contains uh, many more alkaloids, but most of them have not been investigated, uh, and certainly not in terms of their synergistic effect in the whole plant. And mescaline has been extensively studied in uh, uh, psychiatry at the beginning of 20th uh, century, but then it fell out of use and has been replaced by research with LSD. And if you are, want to know more, I'd recommend an excellent book by Mike J. called Mescaline. Uh, but today I'm going to talk mostly about Piotr's ecology and conservation, and there is a serious knowledge gap in this. There have been a lot of studies of ethnobotany, anthropology, pharmacology, chemistry, medicine, but there has been very, very little research into biology and ecology, and a lot of it is also not published. Uh, but what we do know is uh, Piyota grows uh, in the United States only in the state of Texas, in small parts of South and West Texas, and most of its range is in Mexico. Uh, it has a very wide range, but it's not evenly distributed across it. It grows in small pockets here and there. And also there is a, a lot of uncertainty about the edges. For example, uh, we don't really know exactly where it, whether it still grows in the more northern parts of Texas or in the uh, west parts of Mexico. Uh, in terms of uh, conservation, there have been reports going back as far as 30 years. The first, it's been documented in 84 that there has been decline in natural populations of peyote. And uh, uh, in terms of protection in Mexico, it's uh, protected, uh, uh, it's subject to special protection since 2010. And the latest assessment from the International Union for Conservation of Nature lists this cactus as vulnerable. Assessment has been done in 2009, and uh, uh, the status is that the uh, populations continue to decrease, about 30% decrease, and it's projected to continue. 
So there is very important to keep track of the populations and see if this trend continues. Uh, in terms of international regulations, together with the other cacti, peyote is listed in Convention on International Trade on Endangered Species. So uh, international trade is very restricted. And mescaline, but not peyote cactus, is listed the uh, UN Convention on Narcotic Drugs. Uh, in the United States, peyote, the whole the cactus itself, is listed as Schedule One drug under Controlled Substance Act. And federal law prohibits uh, uh, collection and possession of peyote, except for the members of Native American Church uh, who can prove uh, Native American ancestry and uh, certain people who are licensed to conduct research or to be licensed distributors of peyote. And it's not yet listed under Endangered Species Act, so there is no protection in terms of um, from any environmental agencies in the United States. Uh, peyote is a very long-living species. It um, uh, lives uh, many decades, uh, but uh, also it has a very slow growth rate and low levels of establishment. It's estimated that it takes about 10 years uh, for peyote to uh, grow large enough from seed in the wild. Of course, in cultivation, uh, it can grow faster. Uh, but this means that if something disrupts the population, uh, it takes a very, very long time for plants to recover. And we can see it in, uh, if you go to the United States, to the areas where there have been agriculture or root plowing or some disruption, disruption in the land, even 50 years ago, uh, cacti don't come back. It takes very long time. Mostly prickly pears, but don't pee at them. Uh, low densities and plants with smaller size reduce the possibility of uh, sexual reproduction, and this leads to a loss of genetic variability, and that's quite dangerous for, for the plants. Uh, in terms of uh, what has been happening in Texas, in terms of population growth, uh, since 1997, there have been about 40% uh, increase in population, and that corresponds increase in the urban development. But you can still see that most of the land in Texas is used for grazing. And why is this important? I'll tell in a second. Uh, here you can see the map of uh, land use change in Texas. And uh, do we have a pointer somewhere? I'll just point. Uh, if you remember, the range of peyote grows around here and in these parts of Texas. And especially here in South Texas, there's been increase on population growth and a lot of development is happening. There is also a lot of oil and wind farms and that's endangered habitat. Uh, peyote, uh, uh, in terms of habitat, peyote grows in the shrubland and it likes to grow under the brush, uh, under those uh, nurse plants. Here you can see a picture of a nice peyote habitat. Uh, and those plants that it grows under provide shade, nutrients and protection for it. So it doesn't grow if the native brush is cleared. Uh, however, it's a very, very common practice uh, um, to root plow the land and uh, seed it with the uh, grasses, often non-native grasses that are very invasive and basically take over the native vegetation. And the reason why this happens is that this is a very fast growing grass and you can have a lot more cattle in the field compared to uh, shrubland. And this is very, very common practice in Texas. Uh, as I mentioned before, oil and infra various infrastructures, pipelines destroy peyote habitat. And uh, so do wind turbines. You think it's more clean energy, but also to construct them, you need to clear a lot of land around turbines. And it's a very rapidly growing sector in Texas as well. And urban development, of course. Uh, in terms of trade, uh, uh, peyote it's, uh, can be harvested and uh, purchased, and there is uh, trade going on. And Native Americans have been purchasing their medicine in Texas since the 19th century, and the tra uh, trade has been regulated since 1960s. 
Um, only uh, licensed distributors can uh, hire uh, peyoteros who harvest uh, peyote. And currently there are four registered distributors who employ multiple peyoteros. Uh, here are the latest figures uh, in terms of peyote trade. And you can see uh, that currently it's about one and a half million buttons are sold per, per year. Button is the harvested peyote crown. And the price is growing and um, supply is uh, reducing. Uh, the latest data we have is uh, as of 2016. That's from Department of Public Safety that has been collecting this data. But unfortunately, they stopped collecting this data and now it, it's the end. It's a lot harder to get more recent data on the trade. Uh, but what I'm trying to say here, there is legal trade is not sufficient to satisfy the demand for peyote. Uh, and it's estimated that it's between five and 10 million buttons per year. So one and a half million buttons that are sold legally is probably not enough. And a typical Native American ceremony requires about 300 buttons. Uh, in terms of illegal trade, very, very little is known about illegal trade in peyote uh, and about plants in general. And this has been termed plant blindness. Most of studies uh, investigating illegal trade were looking at uh, big charismatic mammals such as rhinos and elephants and now pangolins. Very few studies investigated plants. But the ones that did a lot of trade is happening in uh, precious woods like rosewood uh, and orchids and other cacti. And it's uh, estimated that 31% of all cactus species are threatened with extinction and 47 of those species are impacted by illegal trade, including peyote. Uh, one way to estimate illegal trade is through looking at the records of police seizures and Again, I've requested the Depart Texas Department of Public Safety about their records on peyote trade, but uh, of, of seizures of illegal peyote, but they have very little information and what they have just shows very, very small numbers. Like if you compare it to even LSD seizures in 2017, they had 500 grams of LSD and 59 grams of peyote. So basically it's highly underreported or not even checked. Uh, there are also gray areas uh, with illegal trade. There are anecdotal reports that there is a lot of poaching happening in Texas. And poaching there is in South Texas is colloquially known as fence jumping. Um, and it basically means trespassing on private land where uh, there hasn't been no permission from the landowner to harvest peyote. And, uh, uh, collect there. And many ranchers complain that it's a very common occurrence, uh, although some say that they don't mind if somebody harvests peyote from the land, so there is a bit of variety there. And it's speculated that uh, people who harvest the peyote are selling it to the licensed distributors and then it becomes part of the legal trade, so there is some blending between the two. So. Uh, in, to summarize, the Texas Department of Public Safety and they have extensive regulations about who can harvest and where, but there are absolutely no regulations about how or what plants to harvest. And that's in contrast to other plants, for example, medicinal plants, for example, ginseng, where there are strict regulations about what plants you can harvest and at what times of the year. So in terms of my study, uh, our aim was to survey populations in South and West Texas and compare their densities uh, and structures. And our second objective was to create sustainable harvesting guidelines uh, to be used by legal, uh, by legal peyote harvesters. Uh, my original idea was to compare populations that have been poached, never harvested or legally harvested. But of course, researching uh, never goes as planned and we have we had a lot of problems with the private landowners in terms of access to the land and for various reasons it was impossible to uh, get to the populations that have never been harvested or even the ones that have been legally harvested uh, and most of peyote in the United States grows on private land and in fact 
95% of all land in Texas is privately owned. So there really is very, very important to have a good relationship with the landowners to be able to even survey populations and, and do research there. Uh, but uh, we managed to secure access to, three, uh, to six sites. Three of them were in South Texas and uh, three in West Texas. Uh, South Texas is, uh, and West Texas have very, very different uh, ecosystems. In South Texas, it's uh, Tamalipan thorn scrub, uh, where peyote grows in this dense shrubland. And it usually grows on ridges and caliche plateaus with uh, gray sandy loam soils. And uh, there is uh, shrub cover and overstory canopy. And the main plants there are black brush, coahilo, cat's claw. Basically, every single plant there has either uh, thorns or spines. It's a very interesting area to work in, where you come in covered in all the thorns going through this thick brush. And the other area is Chihuahuan Desert, uh, where peyote grows on dry slopes with the significant uh, substrate of exposed rock. And overall cover is generally quite low and other plants are creosote bush, uh, desert olive, sage, uh, sotol, and a lot of prickly pears. And this habitat in Texas is usually is a lot drier and significantly colder as well than South Texas. Uh, in terms of our surveys, we have generated transects running north, south um, on major coordinate lines. And this has been done to avoid bias, so we don't go to the locations where the null populations are, and we get um, more random and less biased sample. And uh, we have also delineated suitable peyote habitat, so that we don't just look everywhere, and suitable habitat was uh, appropriate soils or geological substrates, and no past or present uh, agriculture, uh, root plowing, or any development. Uh, in the field, uh, all the plants that were found within transects were marked and tagged. Uh, for each plant we measured is diameter, number of crowns, uh, and uh, coordinates. And this has been done, the marking, because we want to continue coming back to those sites and track the population over time. We want to look at uh, plant survival, seedling recruitment, and all sorts of things to model population dynamics. And this is going to be a longitudinal study. Uh, I've encountered lots of really, really interesting animals and wildlife, and it's been an amazing place to work with. And some scary wildlife, as you can see, rattlesnakes, tarantulas, and black widows. And even the narcotics police who tried to tow away our car thinking that we were the drug traffickers from Mexico. <laughs> but they were not interested in peyote at all. Uh, in terms of uh, analysis, our main variables were population densities and of the population structure, we looked at crown numbers and total plant volume. And we'll use predictor variables as location, site, elevation, slope, uh, climate. And uh, I haven't done the modeling yet because I just came back from the field about a month ago. So watch the space, the modeling results will be coming soon. Um, so this is the site characteristics of the sites we've been in. Three of them, uh, they're all in private ownership, but three of them are used for conservation and three general ranching, there is cattle there. Uh, three are in South and three in West Texas. And in terms of peyote densities, which is the main thing, one had significantly, one had a lot higher density than the others. The others were similar. And if you compare South and West Texas in general, uh, there is uh, a lot higher density of peyote in uh, West Texas. And the difference between in the West Texas uh, the populations have not been commercially harvested ever. Most of the harvesting was happening in South Texas and it's still happening there and that's where the licensed distributors are. Uh, in terms of the number of crowns, uh, you can see it's pretty similar both in South and West Texas and this reflects that all our sites uh, were 
not re uh, harvested and even in uh, South Texas they haven't been harvested recently but they have been harvested maybe then or more years ago and we can tell this by the uh, plant sizes as you can see in uh, West uh, tax, uh, Texas uh, plant sizes are a lot uh, larger, so there are a lot more larger plants and there are big certain ribbed plants while in South Texas most of the plants we have encountered were smaller of a smaller size Modeling is coming soon. So in summary, this is the first study to estimate the densities of peyote in USA and we can find considerable differences between West and South Texas uh, and in terms of population structure, most of our plants had one crown and peyote usually produces multiple crowns as a result of harvesting or some other stress. Uh, and the applications of our study is, as I mentioned, it's a baseline for further research that will track and model population dynamics. And it's also going to aid in discovering new populations if we understand what environmental variables are important for peyote. And uh, maybe, who knows, in the future it's going to help with revolving efforts and uh, trying to uh, restore peyote populations from where it has disappeared. And the second part of our study was to come up with the harvesting guidelines. And in terms of uh, sustainability, this is the key thing. Of course, no harvest is sustainable and every harvest damages wild populations, but there are ways to harvest that it doesn't endanger long-term survival. But there are three important components that uh, have to be uh, taken into consideration. First is biological sustainability, which means that uh, populations uh, are able to survive in the wild, but it's also very important that it's social sustainability where the, there is a delicate balance between religious interests and conservation interests and uh, the rights of uh, Native Americans and um, all indigenous people are not uh, imperiled by trying to uh, and, and not limited. And also there must be financial sustainability where it is more profitable to conserve land rather than to use it for something else. Uh, so for peyote, biological sustainability means understanding peyote populations and uh, knowing what rate of harvesting is um, going to be sustainable so the population can replenish itself after each harvesting. Uh, these uh, guidelines reflect current knowledge and of course they're going to be updated uh, and changed as we discover and find out more about harvesting. Uh, the first thing to know about uh, for harvesting is peyote anatomy and it uh, consists of the crown which is the green photosynthesizing part, then there is subterranean stem and root and it's very very important to only harvest the top, the green part, and not take the plants with the roots, and which sometimes happens even now. And if you look at the pictures of the uh, peyote, very often you can see it's taken with the roots. Uh, also, it's worth noting that there is no point even taking the roots in terms of masculine concentration. The highest concentration is in the green crowns. Uh, also very important is to rotate gathering uh, sites and to reharvest every eight to ten years. Uh, one longitudinal study so far tracked survival after harvesting events and uh, they found that uh, eight years is about the appropriate time where peyote can regenerate and uh, grow to the same size as it was before harvesting. That's in Texas. All, all I'm talking about is in Texas. Uh, another recommendation is to harvest only mature plants and a very, very easy metric to apply in the field uh, that correlates with age and size is the number of ribs. So big uh, ribs are those segments. So you can see here there are five segments 
and here is going to be 13 segments. Um, and Piotr grows ribs in the Fibonacci pattern, so it's 5, 8, or 13. So recommendation is to harvest larger plants that have 8 or more ribs. Uh, but also uh, leave some big 13 rib plants for the future. The big plants produce the most seeds, so if you remove them from the population, uh, you need somehow to replenish the seeds and, uh, and not decrease the availability of the seeds. And also look after plants. If uh, somebody harvesting it sees uprooted plants by feral hogs or just by harvesting it, it's important to plant them back. And also uh, we recommend to harvest not throughout the whole year, but uh, maybe in, uh, after the seeds are produced. Uh, currently the practice is to harvest throughout the whole year and uh, there are no regulations about when to harvest. It's basically whenever it's possible to get leases to harvest. Also what is unknown is how masculine concentration changes throughout the year and that's going to be a very interesting project to do if you uh, find if it's found then masculine concentration for example is higher after a dry winter which could be the case but we don't know what it is. And another recommendation is to leave the seeds so if you're harvesting the plants and you find seeds in there just leave the seeds there in the environment and not take it with the plant. Uh, in terms of moving forward uh, we are partnering with indigenous biota conservation initiative which is an international collaboration supporting tribes and efforts focusing on sustainability and hopefully they can take those harvesting guidelines further and make sure there are more. And what else can be done in terms of piota conservation? One way is uh, to acquire more land for conservation even though it's costly and difficult. Another is to organize salvage operations so work together if there is construction of new wind turbines or oil infrastructure to make sure that they replant piota to different sites. And this is happening for other plants that are endangered in the USA, but not for piota. And of course, work with the regulatory and legal changes and education and consumer choice, for example, um, not buying the plants that are harvested with the root or the ones that are too small. And of course, the long-term solution to piota crisis is cultivation. We need to publish and develop and share protocols for growing and promote this more. Uh, I want to thank my supervisors, uh, Martin Terry from Cactus Conservation Institute, and also my university supervisors, Colin and Marcus from Imperial College London and Kew Gardens and Norma Fowler, who helped with statistical analysis. Thank you very much.